I'm very superstitious because it worked well when I wore this jacket and, uh, and uh, it has something to do with chlorophyll that is green. And um, even though I'm getting insulted for this jacket because my friends say, Klaus, why do you wear this tracker jacket when you give lectures? But I want to wear this jacket. So uh, we now would like to talk about the light harvesting system. So the protein surrounding this, this, uh, uh, this reaction center. And uh, we need to know first the information on the structure. And uh, so I showed you already some information on the reaction center, the big ring. And so I gave a little bit away some of it. But in fact, it was us who contributed to finding the structure of these systems. Because we really were driven to understand how the system works. And you know, sometimes you're really desperate. You, you, you want to work, you want to understand the system, but there is no structure available, and very little you can do as a biophysicist without a structure. And so one day, we, we had uh, Hartmut Michel, who got the Nobel Prize, one of the Nobel Prize winners for, for, the, for the structural reaction center visit here, and we had a, we had a party, a pretty nice uh, party, not at all in wild. And uh, then in the middle of it, he confided to me that he said, Klaus, you know, I have this, I have a crystal of this reaction center, uh, of, this, of this light harvesting protein. Yes, you have, oh, 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 great, when do you have a structure? I have it since years, and I cannot face my crystallographic data. I don't get a structure. And he was crying on my shoulder, and we were both very sad. <laughs> and this was the problem he had. he had. He had diffraction data like this. He knew these amplitudes. He called it the diffraction peaks. They are real numbers. But if you want to get the structure of a protein, you need to know for each of these speckles a phase so that you can put them then in the Fourier transform. The result of the Fourier transform is the electron density, shown here this cloud. And then you have the electron density. You can thread through this density the amino acid secret of the protein. And then you know where every atom is. And then you have a structure. That's how it works. But you need these phases. There are two ways of getting the phases. One is that you are, actually today there are three, there, there, there's even a new, new way of changing the wavelengths of the scattering. You can get today the phases very elegantly. So some of the problem is not so bad anymore today. But uh, this is only true with very intense laser sources that are sweepable. And so that was not the case two years ago. The other one is, you are co-crystallizing your protein with heavy metals. And then you're getting actually several crystals. And you can then geometrically, you're getting then different diffraction peaks depending on which crystal you have. You co-crystallize with heavy metals that go particular positions. And then you can geometrically reconstruct from the different position of the speckles the phases for each of them. Uh, the third is that you have already solved this protein a similar protein, then you take the phases from the similar protein, combine it with your diffraction data, and if your similar protein, we understand it better today, we didn't understand it earlier, is 80% of it agrees with your protein, is two angstrom, within two angstrom distance for each atom, then you can use the phases of that other model, and then you can get here the, the density, then what you do is, you do actually iterative calculation, like Thomas Schlick told you how to calculate square root of A. You are doing iteratively, you are taking, the getting the density, you pull the, uh, the, the atoms through, you're getting the new structure, you use a list structure to get the phases, you use the observed uh, diffraction peaks, get the new density, pull through, and iteratively until you converge. But you need phases that are in the radius of convergence of this method. The result is independent of it. But you have to get into there. And now the method was only used when you had a protein that was very close. Then you could cheat and take the phases from the protein. But he didn't have a protein that was solved already. In fact, we want to know what it looked like. And, uh, and so, so maybe because he was so drunk, he, he did something what the crystallographers usually would never do, ask a theoretician for help. And he said, could you possibly 
built a model of this protein. We know already, we have many good hints about it. Could you build a model of the protein so that we take from your model the phases and then iteratively solve the system? And so I said, yes, of course. The next day I told my coworkers, we do this now. And they, of course, they said, are you crazy, Klaus? And I had five people, and one of them was Chichi Hu, and there were four others, and we went on, and the first one dropped out, and the second one dropped out, and the third one dropped out. I was the fourth, uh, <laughs> and then I was, uh, I was the fourth, I was going to drop out. Every day, Xichi Hu came to my office. Usually, I go to my, to my students and tell them, don't give up, you know, this is solvable. But in this case, I was sitting there and thinking, we don't do it. And Xichi Hu came every day and said, Klaus, we do it, we make it, don't worry. And so he was really the leader there. And so we, we built a model. The first model was bad. Then we tried it. It just didn't work with outside the radius of convergence. And the fifth one made it. And so the fifth one got then a structure with very good statistics, good resolution, uh, 2.4 angstrom, uh, you know, an R factor that tells us that, we have a, that there is no chance that this is the wrong structure. And so you could see that we contributed to the structure here. While this went, there was actually a structure of a very similar protein salt in England by Richard Cockdell. And um, so we were not really quite the first, but uh, we were very close. And our protein had, you know, very significant differences from his. So it was very good that we had two structures at the same time. So uh, we could then see immediately what I told you about, that the chlorophylls there, that each of these proteins formed a ring with eight units. We had a big ring and a small ring. This is a small ring protein. And each of them contained 24 chlorophylls. Here a ring of 16 chlorophylls, and here a ring of eight chlorophylls. And they absorb, they absorb at 800 nanometer, so these are the key absorbers. They also absorb a little at 800 nanometer, but these are the ones who are being used by that, by that uh, bacterium mainly for the absorption at 800. They are carotenoids, and the carotenoids absorb at 500 nanometer. And so you see it contains eight of these, and so we saw immediately how these proteins were held in this, uh, how these chromophores were held in the protein. Now, we we only needed to guess 80% of the structure of the protein. 20% we didn't have to guess. 80% we had to get two angstrom right, but 20% we didn't. And there were certain things we didn't know at all of, of this protein. And the result was that I, as a humble physicist who can hardly spell chlorophyll correctly, in fact, I, uh, for many years I, I misspelled it, I discovered new chemistry. And so the, the chemistry that we found was that how the chlorophyll in this protein is ligated, held in the protein. It is held usually by a histidine group, but in this case it's an aspartate and the water. So I have my name on, the, on this chemistry, and usually when you find this chemistry by having really good knowledge of chemistry and intuition, but here it was just modeling. And, uh, and, 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 and of course also crystallography, but this was really fun to discover something like a new ligation pattern. Here we also saw how the chlorophylls are held in this, in this one ring of 16 chlorophylls. They overlap each other. Here you see two of them in one of these units. And we saw that each chlorophyll is connected, if you look at it here, through three hydrogen bridges, through three bonds. Here the histidine magnesium bond, and here two hydrogen, bridge, hydrogen bonds. And you know that when you have a rigid body, and you hold it at one point, it can move a lot. If you hold it at two points, it can still move around an axis. But if you hold it at three points, it's fixed. So you see here very nicely that nature wanted this chlorophyll to be really fixed, so that they don't wobble around in the protein. So that's what we saw then. And so we knew this protein. And now this protein is has one remarkable property, and that is that it is made of each of these units of two independent proteins here and three chlorophylls and one carotenoid. So you have here eight independent inside, eight outside, and the chlorophyll. So you have 16 proteins, 
24 chlorophylls and 8 carotenoids. And if you throw this in the membrane, it spontaneously assembles. In fact, it assembles first very quickly in this unit of two proteins, three chlorophylls and one carotenoid. And then these units assemble into the big thing, the whole ring. And now I want you to understand how they assemble. This was really something. But you know, how even this VMD, VMD is good, but no, VMD is not that good. So I didn't understand it. And so there was a lucky event that at the, at the San Diego Supercomputer Center, they got a new Xerox machine, a three-dimensional Xerox machine that can make three-dimensional copies. So I asked them if it's possible that we could send them one of our units and that they would make a, a copy of it. And, uh, and uh, they said yes, and I said, how much will it cost? They said, $250. Okay, okay, $250. So we said, please send us one. And they sent it, and then came the thing that looked, please pardon me, but it's just true. It looked like what dogs do. <laughs> and so I, so I didn't know what was top and bottom. So I, so I had to add more money into it. And here we have in the city a wonderful uh, Russian icon painter. And so I asked the lady if she could paint it for me. So she sat in front of, 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 of me and me, and then she painted this. And then I got, for 250 plus, what I had to give the lady, I got one copy of these proteins. And here it is. Here it is. So you see here, maybe we have now the full light, or I think we have enough light. So, so here you see the blue helix, the red helix. You see here the yellow is the carotenoid. And the green stuff are the chlorophylls. There are two chlorophylls here, two things, and one chlorophyll here. This is the 800 nanometer. These are 850 nanometer chlorophylls. This is this, uh, uh, this is this eight, uh, this is the carotenoid as well, and it's 500 nanometer. And this thing is its own template. When it sees its sister, it connects with it very quickly. And when it sees the next sister, it builds, it has three, four, five, six, they form a ring. And I wanted to know how it works. But, you know, I mean, I'm well funded uh, by, by NSF, but, you know, 250 plus 50 painting. Ah, what the heck, I said. <laughs> so, I got the second copy. <laughs> <laughs> and when it came, we were racing. You, you cannot believe it. First we had the paint, then we were racing there to put it together. And we were so tense, we couldn't do it. I mean, it doesn't work. Oh my God, it doesn't work. And then finally we were so tired, we were very relaxed and sick. There it went. <laughs> so you just have to be rude like nature and you know, let it flow and that is. Isn't that nice? This is how nicely they aggregate, how they are made as a template for each other. And you will see then here that this carotenoid touches this chlorophyll. You will see later that it's very, very important. They form this, this, this dimer in this great, wonderful, right? But you know, the third one, $500 plus, plus $100 painting, six months. Kamala, I hope you forgive me that I, that I, that I felt I've, I needed at least a third to see that it works. So, okay, so I got a third. <laughs> so I got a third. And it worked very nicely, isn't it nice? And then I discovered something. I discovered that these people at the San Diego Supercomputer Center, they are brilliant computer scientists. They're really good. They have always the latest equipment and everything works. But, you know, as any computer scientist, they are really disorganized. <laughs> a bill didn't come yet. So I said, <laughs> 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 maybe they never bill us. <laughs> and so I offer that a fourth one. <laughs> and now I have to, no, no, I have to collaborate with Will. So you, you help me here. Yeah? Actually, no, no. You, 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 uh, you do this, so you come here, 
and you hold it, and Will, Will is brilliant, and both of you are brilliant, but, uh, but now I test Will, I hope you forgive me. You have to build the rest. Don't drop them, <laughs> they, the bill may still come. So, put them together. I told you lose, you can, you can cheat and look there. Okay. Maybe someone would you want to help him with the other two? Quickly, we don't have time. They want to put you on attention, but uh, you know, we cannot take forever here. Yeah? Yeah. Nature does it in a millisecond. Ah, I should have known, you never solved a problem by committee, right? <laughs> <laughs> but the blue are together, the blue are together, look. The blues are together, here is it right. The blues are, yeah, 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 you go, 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 smooth, lose, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. I think you're there, you're there. Yes, almost. You see, yeah, you, you had it already, yes, you had it already. It, there were already, it was yeah. correct. So now you do it with him, you two. No fight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no force, no force, lose. <laughs> and you have it already, you just, you just, yeah. you, you, you don't, you don't, uh, you are not, you, you, you can trust yourself much more, you're doing it well. So now you dock with him, yeah. now dock, <laughs> so. Okay, good. Great. <laughs> Here, give them some round of applause. They did it. <laughs> Very good. Uh, <laughs> no, no voting. So, actually, uh, we also solved a mystery that was really uh, asked for a long time, and that was you have here two helices, and then you have here these helices coming out. It's an angle, you see them here, on the top there. And people never knew what they were for. And they always asked this question, and finally we discovered it. They are there to put it on a table. <laughs> because if you put it like this, it falls apart. But they are just angled right that it stands. <laughs> so nature sometimes has lots of foresight. Okay, so let's continue now to look inside this thing. So first we had this small ring. The big ring protein was harder to get because there was no crystallographic data. Um, but the unit of the big ring protein, these are shown here, they're called LH1. The small ring protein is LH2, are very similar, very homologous. If you do your bioinformatics, you see that there is a great homology. And so you feel you can build it properly. And also since we had succeeded to build the small ring, and get a good search model for the crystallographic data, we felt we could also get the big ring, and so we built it, and then we compared it to the to, to electron microscopy data. Without any fudging, we got a good fit. You see the black one is a, is a model, and the blue is the data, and they fit it perfectly together, and so very convinced that we actually have now a model, a good model of the big ring, and it fits actually very nicely around the reaction center, as you see here. And here you see then, we saw it already earlier, that it fits nicely around the reaction center. And uh, so we have now a model for the small ring protein, for the big ring. And now you see already some really interesting stuff. You see here that the 16 chlorophylls are here corresponding to 32 chlorophylls. It's a twice the size as this big ring protein. And so they're all in one plane. This is a membrane here. You see that the chlorophylls are obviously in an interesting arrangement. And uh, now you could put it all together into a bigger ring system. You take these three units and put in a bigger one. And then you take the protein away, as I did earlier already. And now you have this wonderful hierarchical structure of chlorophylls, big ring, reaction center with the two chlorophylls that use the energy the small rings, and now you have really uh, the, the opportunity to really ask the question how nature designed this wonderful hierarchy of, 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 of uh, aggregates to 
absorb photons somewhere in the periphery and they get the photon energy conducted to the center quickly enough that you have as little loss processes as possible. So what, what these glow fields would usually do is they would fluoresce and they fluoresce sort of like in a nanosecond and uh, this process, as you see, takes only 30 picoseconds from any part of the system to the reaction center, the energy flows in 30 picoseconds. And so you realize then that nature is using this energy rather than fluorescing it away. It would of course be nice if the plant would fluoresce a little, right? It would be wonderful, uh, showy, but uh, particularly for parties, but, but it's uh, better that the energy is actually used here. And so now this is a question or post to the biophysicist to make sense of the system. Why is this system designed? Can we quantitatively or at least semi-quantitatively understand that an absorption process anywhere on the periphery leads to the, the excitation flow to the center? But this is, of course, physics. A little tough physics, so you know, some of you uh, who might not be so conversant with this physics might now take a little nap, and I promise you that I wake you up in, in five, seven minutes. And for the other ones, I just go quickly through this description. And uh, at the end of it, we see that we can really make wonderful sense of, of, of this structure. We can show that uh, maybe not you know, within a factor two, but definitely with an order of magnitude, we can understand all the rates of excitation flow in the system and understand thereby the how nature designed this efficient system at the core of the energy needs of the of the uh, of the of our whole life uh, uh, of of, our, of the of life on Earth. Here, I just would like to say that this was a hard earned model. It was it took a lot of time. There's some writing you might want to read it later. that just says that how important it is that you do not start with a preconceived idea how this may work, but you first put your energy into getting the basics. And you might have to, not you might, you usually have to team up with, with experimental people. They're very critical of theoreticians because they don't like these people who are trying to go shortcuts. If I'm so intelligent, nature better do things the way I, I think it up now, uh, rather than first looking and then thinking. So, uh, you are going to do something yourself too. You cannot do this very sophisticated physics, but you can understand one key process here. And so your tutorial will ask you to look at this ring protein that we just built together there. And actually, that all of you have the fun. I give you this, uh, these models, they are bigger. And, uh, you can try to put them together. So I just show you that they fit together, and uh, and you should do it now, so that you. Uh, oops, do they? No, I guess okay. So they fit together. This is a solution, and now you try to find the solution yourself, and um, then give it to the next one. So you have some little fun here for the next hour. So, so you are taking these two units, or actually first one unit, and you, in, you, you inspect it, the structure of it, and, uh, and, uh, and look at the chromophores inside and so on. Then, you know, here I remind you again of the structure of the whole ring. And then um, here you see the individual chlorophylls with their transition dipole moments. And that is a property that is very important for the excitation transfer. Basically, we would like to know how is excitation electronically coupled between these chlorophylls? And what matters there is the, what is called the transition dipole moment. It is the optimal direction in which these chlorophylls absorb light. And you call that the transition dipole moment. So you can absorb not light at all in the orthogonal. And as you go closer, better and better, it's described by cosine squared angle of that angle that you form. And, uh, and so you need a transition dipole moment. And then you have a formula that is written here that describes the coupling. And you see, you need to know 
these transition diapermoms are called DI for the ice chlorophyll. And this is in a very famous formula. It's called induced dipole, induced dipole interaction. It's the same as a famous Van der Waals interaction. So the famous Van der Waals interaction in the excited state leads to excitation transfer. And this is the formula. And now you need to know the distance between the centers of these chlorophylls. For example, you might want to know how fast when this absorbs 800 photon does it transfer excitation to there. And uh, you need then from this formula the transition dipole moment of di, the transition dipole moment orientation of dj, and the distance rij, not only the distance, but also the orientation of the distance. And the heads here are all what you are called unit vectors, so they, they just give the direction of the connection and of the transition dipole moments. And from that, you're also given the constants. You can calculate then the transfer rate, and you find that the transfer rate here is just about a picosecond. They're so close together that within the picosecond, an excitation here jumps to that ring. And uh, so that's what you do. And uh, okay, uh, maybe we maybe we just go through the tough physics, and then we then we deserve the the break. Is that okay? <coughs> and so then you know uh, uh, that might be better when you come back from the break. We start with the tough physics and. And then you want to have a nice ending of this of this workshop and not go here. So, so the physicists they realize that the that the excitation of these chlorophylls in this ring they are so close together is not just a hop hop hop, but rather when you excite one of the chlorophylls they are interacting with all the other chlorophylls and you're getting a pretty coherent excitation. They call it an exciton. So the excitation is quantum mechanically coherently spread over this, and this is what you want to understand. Uh, so you are doing then the kind of calculation that we just did for all the 16 chlorophylls in here. And uh, when you, you apply this formula for induced dipole and induced dipole, you can apply it for chlorophylls that are further apart than, uh, than their size. So here the chlorophyll is about 10 angstrom. From here to here you have 20 angstrom, and then you can apply a multipole formula. But you cannot apply a multipole formula when the distance between objects is smaller than their size. And so for the neighbors, you cannot apply the formula. You have to sort of guess what the coupling is. And also if you look carefully here, you find that you have a symmetry, but you don't have a 16-fold symmetry, you only have an 8-fold symmetry. These two chlorophylls are closer together than this one. So here you have 9 angstrom, 10 angstrom, 9 angstrom, 10 angstrom, 9 angstrom, 10 angstrom. So you have sort of like a pairing, a dimerization here. And you can calculate all these couplings that are called W. The Vs, you don't know. And you also don't know exactly the excitation energy of each chlorophyll inside the protein. But in principle, this is how this Hamiltonian looks like. And in principle, you can solve it as you learned in quantum mechanics, you can calculate the excitation of these chlorophylls. And each of these energies corresponds now not to an individually excited chlorophyll, but rather to a coherently excited ring of chlorophylls. And the energies you can calculate, and you find here, oh, they're very difficult to read, you find then here some real numerical values. They depend only on the geometry of the ring, otherwise you know exactly what these energies are, and I can, the formats are particularly simple. For this, and this, and this, and this, we call them the band, the band edges of the, of the excitation. So you have, uh, you can know this. But you do not know these parameters, epsilon zero, V1, V2, and also you don't know the prefactor here of this expression. And um, what we did is we teamed up with the late, uh, uh, Mike Zerner, and, uh, and uh, we, uh, he did the biggest quantum chemistry calculation done at that time for an entire ring of chlorophylls to get the excitation energies. And they just look like the energy distributed just like what you get out of this model that you can do actually in, in quantum physics class. And now, since we had simple formulas for the bent edges, we could say, let's choose our four parameters. We have here four different energies that we can match. 
such that we are getting agreement with Mike Zerner's calculation. And from that, we could then fit all the parameters of this chlorophyll, and we could calculate the spectrum now. We have what is called an effective Hamiltonian for this entire ring. Uh, now, that is actually a little simplification because, as you see here, the chlorophylls in this molecule are rattling around. This is like the Swiss watch I told you, that is, that is um, the, where things are not as precise. So what I just told you would be the proper description, and actually was experimentally proven, when you pour liquid helium over the poor plant or the poor bacterium. Then you have this order, but in, under normal circumstances, you have this rattling motion, and so this complete symmetry that I told you, this eightfold symmetry, is actually broken, and the question is how badly is it broken, and how much does it change this picture of a complete coherent quantum mechanical spread? And here you see how when you're doing this calculation that was done actually by, by Anna Damjanovic, she calculated the, the, the the, the Hamiltonian as it changed in time. And here you see how the diagonal elements change, and here you see how the off-diagonal elements change. The off-diagonal elements change very little, actually, but the diagonal elements change a lot. And so now we have to account for that, and that changes the coherent character of the electron excitation in this ring. And here you see how over what distance the coherence of the excitation spreads. If you have a very incoherent system, the chlorophylls are individually excited. If you have a very coherent one, they spread over the whole ring, 16 of them are excited. And now you can calculate how many are really excited under physiological temperature condition, and you find, under the conditions that we determine the effective Newtonian, that you have actually this situation here, you have about between five and six being excited. And this is actually in agreement with, ex with, with spectroscopic experiments, so-called uh, pump probe experiments. And these were the most sophisticated kind ever done with four-wave mixing. So with four uh, uh, photons, you are probing this, uh, this, this molecule, and they could then verify that this is actually about the number, the coherent spread of, this, uh, of these excitons. Now, uh, this is a, a, so like a, a simple quantity to calculate, and if you really want to calculate the full nature of the electron excitation, for example, calculate even the spectrum of the electron excitations here, you need to go the same route that you went with electron transfer theory. You calculate now inside the protein for each chlorophyll the electronic excitation. And here you see how it fluctuates. Each of these points takes several hours to compute. And so Anna Damjanovic did the molecular, the, the molecular dynamic simulation of this ring, calculate for each of the chlorophylls at any moment in time these uh, excitation energies. And, uh, and then we all together, the, the, the physicist among us, uh, uh, turned this information into theoretical picture. We took the energy gap correlation function out of it, and then we used the, the, uh, the energy gap correlation function and the spectral density that we calculated just like the way we did it before. So just you could uh, do it yourself if you would rather calculate the energy gap function for the electron excitation than for the electron transfer. You're getting then you know the same spectral density, and then we could show that this was actually many new formulas derived that we could, we could get an expression for the, for the spectrum of these chlorophylls in this ring, and this was a blue curve, and the experiment measured this red curve. And there was no fit anymore, there was no parameter fitted, and we get a perfect agreement. This side bank is this other ring of eight chlorophylls that was not included in our series, so we couldn't get this one. We just were shooting for this one. But you see that we can very nicely dis uh, explain the width and the position of this excitation. And so here you see this is actually a very elegant uh, theory that was published in Physical Review 
as you see here. And so you see that these biological systems can give rise to very advanced and, and, and nice um, theoretical physics. And actually one of the co-authors, one of us, uh, Johann uh, Kostin, and one is uh, Ulrich Kleine Kapphöfer, who is actually maybe in the audience, there he is. So if anybody wants to know the detail, you can ask uh, Ulrich. Now the next chapter I cannot really tell you in more detail. I have to run even faster, even though it is even more beautiful. And this is actually mainly Sena's baby. So he really got some theoretical mathematical physics out of this system that is just remarkable. So the question we have to ask is also not only how the dynamics of this, of this protein is changing the spectrum, but we also need to understand how the randomness that you just get, even when you quench the system to, 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 to t equals zero, you still have an inhomogeneous sample, how this kind of randomness affects the spectrum of the system. And uh, this is really something that we biologists really have to deal with, and the, the quantum chemists really don't, didn't deal with it. They usually do t equals zero quantum chemistry, whereas we biologists have random samples, we have dynamics, and we have to understand electronic systems under these conditions. And so here, maybe I ask the question, how does the static randomness of these uh, chlorophylls affect the spectrum? And you can, uh, you can ask that question by saying that we have this effective Hamiltonian where we have uh, first a contribution of the perfect symmetry Hamiltonian, and then we have another contribution that describes the randomness. So we can say that our Hamiltonian of the system is an ensemble of Hamiltonians, that where each Hamiltonian has a contribution that is all the same for all of them, namely the, the ideal symmetric one, plus a contribution described by random matrix R. And so now, he first investigated this um, uh, as a good physicist. He first wanted to know how much does it matter, how much does a, the, ran, the kind of randomness you have in R matters. You, know, you have Gaussian randomness, you have homogeneous randomness, and since you have a matrix, you can have all kinds of different randomness for the diagonal elements and off-diagonal elements. And so he investigated that for two observables, for the density of states, if you don't have randomness, you have sharp densities. You have one state here, one, two states here, two states here, two states here. Then you see here they come closer for the, these levels. So you have one state here, two, 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 one. Now when you have a random system, you're getting distributions like here, and, and you want to calculate this distribution, you want to know how this randomness is uh, depending on the character of this random matrix, if it's Gaussian and so on. And you also want to calculate the absorption spectrum, and it turns out under ideal condition, only these two states absorb actually electromagnetic radiation. All these other ones are optically forbidden. So you're getting only absorption at this energy, but if you have randomness, then the excitation spreads a little out. You're getting also some absorption in the higher states because of the randomness. And so he then tested this, and he found that when he chose uh, when he chose randomness Gaussian distributed randomness and homogeneous randomness, he got these two results. Ah, you say I see only one. Yes, because within the thickness of the line, you don't see a difference. In order to see the difference between two types of randomness, Gaussian randomness and homogeneous randomness, with the same spread. You don't see any difference. You have to really go to really resolve this curve very, very carefully to see that there is actually a difference between the two numeric results for the density and the absorption spectrum. And even if you, if you choose different matrices, in quantum mechanics, you know, the matrix can be real, but it doesn't have to be real, but it has to be Hermitian Hamiltonian. And so if you take now either symmetric or Hermitian randomness, you, you got a big difference uh, from, a, from a mathematical point of view, you still get not such close agreement, but still very close agreement. But in other words, if you want to describe this system, the, 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 the detailed nature of the randomness doesn't matter. You can choose your favorite randomness. 
And that is what Mehrlich exploited. And it shows the, the randomness is, is, is analytically most tractable, namely Gaussian randomness. And then he calculated exactly the spectral density. He started with a relevant expression. He turned it into some other expression that is equivalent. He turned it into an even more powerful, simple expression uh, with a so-called partition function. And then he you see that the partition function is a ratio of determinants. And now you know that you can calculate one over determinant of a, of a, of a matrix by uh, calculating the Gaussian e to the minus x matrix x, actually rather e, e minus e to the minus x, one over the matrix x. And if you do this Gaussian integral, you get one over determinant. Now, we have, however, ratio of determinant. How can you get the determinant in the numerator? You can do that by doing also Gaussian integral, but with variables that are not commuting, like 2 times 3 is 3 times 2, but that are anti-commuting, where 2 times 3 is minus 3 times 2. And so you're using here what is called supersymmetric calculus that is actually otherwise only used by, by um, elementary particle physicists, physicists, but by them a lot. He uses supersymmetric calculus. Everything has now this funny S in front of it. And there are rules of, of algebra. You can express then this determinant then through very nice Gaussian integrals. It's a little, little complicated, but at the end of the day, he got then some beautiful formulas, analytical formulas, that you can calculate with Mathematica very easily. She looks a little bit formidable, but you put in Mathematica, you just say, what is your randomness? It's controlled by these parameters alpha, and by gamma is the spectrum of the ideal symmetric system. And you can then calculate this analytically. And uh, I don't think I have a results section yet. So, but you're getting then basically these uh, these results that you that we have seen here. And so you see that you can even do, you can even compete with a with a. a, a elementary particle theoreticians, and you're doing here very elegant mathematics because you need to understand random quantum mechanical systems rather than just t equal zero systems. So now what I, I think this is a good point to stop, and I think there is sort of like a nice point of takeoff for the last lecture. Um, I could maybe we just do five minutes questions now if some of the questions seem to be very getting very excited, we can do longer. Otherwise, we can have the longer questions at the end of the of the third quest, uh, lecture. So, please. Uh, oh yes, of course, so yes. Yeah, but that is but 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 nature uses molecules, and molecules have a tendency to absorb better at some wavelength than at other wavelengths. So nature has to live with it. Nature then now tries to tune the absorption uh, um, a spectrum that is a wavelength dependent of the absorption of a molecule into the range where there is a, the sunlight, where sunlight available. So for a plant, it is from 400 nanometer to 800 nanometer. These poor guys are living where all the algae and trees have absorbed all the photons. And if, if you look where, how they have their chromophores spread, they have a window at 300 because, uh, at, at 800, because at red, red has not much energy, so they don't care for the red light. And it happens that they also work with chlorophylls and with carotenoids. And the chlorophylls are more in the red, the carotenoids are more in the blue, and they have a gap at 500 nanometer. And so they shoot now for the, 800 nanometer photons and for the 500 nanometer photons. And they tuned their systems to absorb their using the molecules, using the, how the proteins can steer the spectrum of the molecules, and using randomness. And those are the three factors that contribute where eventually these systems absorb. So what is the, what is the size of the spectrum? The size of? Oh, no, 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 they are not, they, these spectra are never very sharp. 
because you know of the thermal fluctuations of the of the disorder. So the spectra the spectra are usually like um, uh, I think the width is almost 100 nanometer. Okay, so one, one, two, three. So your friend. So I, I didn't even understand. I'm pretty sure your colleagues didn't understand it. You have to speak up. W13, no, not for those because we have a dimer radiation. The same for W13 and W35. They are the same, but W13 and W24 are not the same because we have a dimerized system. And when we, of course, describe the random system, then the, the Ws are all random and none of them are, have a symmetry. So, so I didn't understand the last two sentences. No. In the H zero, no, not all of them. I told you the symmetry is broken. So basically, we are we are forming a a, a, a kreis and we have couples, um, men, woman, men, woman, men, woman. And so that is our circle. Otherwise, we all look the same, and it's a totally symmetric Christ, but the men and women are a little clo closer together. That's what we describe. And so that is why W13 uh, w is, if I hold my head on the head of the next guy, here's a lady, then this is W13, and then if I'm this guy, W35 is the same, where W24 a lady, lady distances. Mm -hmm. My question was uh, are there no differences between the kinetic field against the regular? Or how, how do they find the major and the minor symmetry? Yeah, it's a, it is, a, it is a, a not directional in terms of space direction, but it's direction in terms of energy. Because the small rings absorb at little higher energy than the big ring. And uh, the same chlorophylls, but since there are more of them, the energy, uh, the, the lowest excitation is lower. So you have a funnel. The outside ones have, have uh, 850, the next one 870, and even lower is then the, the, the special pair that takes the energy on. And, in, and when it's really getting dark, then the, 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 the bacteria even produce further satellite rings against small rings that absorb at 830, puts it to the outside, 830, 850, 870. So the energy makes it go in, and, uh, and the ring allows any coupling to anywhere, but of course, since everything goes downhill in energy uh, because of thermodynamics, it gravitates to the reaction center. By the static disorder. What is you are just the randomness that is that is always there. When you when you are looking at spectra, then you find that uh, that one sample is very different from the next sample. Today there is a dramatic realization of this. So in a way we are living really in a heavenly field, because what you can do is you can put spread these rings on a substrate. And you can spread them thinly, that you have one here, and then thousand angstrom one here, and then one here. Then you shine light on them, under the microscope you see the speckles. And now you know where they sit. Because when you don't have a reaction center there, they fluoresce actually the light back, because the light has no energy to go. Some of it becomes heat, but much of it fluoresces back. And now you go with, an, with, an, with another very small microscope, a very high resolution microscope, over each of these speckles that correspond to one ring, and now we can study the optical properties of one ring at a time, and you see they're really different. 
you see, you can see the spectrum, one spectrum like this, one spectrum like this, one spectrum like this, and they're, they're all over the landscape. That's an ensemble averaging. That exactly what we do is we calculate the spectrum of the ensemble. Yeah. That is what it would be, quench disorder. Uh, not, not quite. Uh, first, we do not know exactly how the rings are distributed. That is something that is being studied now, and, uh, and, uh, uh, but we do not know that yet. But this interaction is very, very weak. It is basically Van der Waals interaction, and uh, you know, it, uh, Van der Waals interaction in the excited state since you have degeneracy. If you either this close to the excited or that one. So if this one excited this energy, if this one excited this energy. So we have two states. They're coupled now to the Van der Waals. And so you're getting a transfer now. But the interaction is very weak, like the normal Van der Waals excitation, uh, interaction. And so you, uh, they, they, they don't shift the spectrum enough. So from one ring to the next one, you can forget it. You can calculate very quickly the transfer rate is a few picoseconds. And if you take, uh, if you translate a picosecond through the uncertainty principle into energy shift, you find it's 10 to the minus 4 EV. So it's a very, very small shift. It's, it's enough coupling to get there in the picosecond, but in terms of, of quantity of energy, is a very small energy. It's a one hundredth of a, of a kT, so very little energy coupling. Yeah, that's the first step. Yeah, it is, uh, you know, like we have to learn about this order. We, we, we biophysicists cannot just assume all this, everything is ordered because we would, nature lives with this disorder. We would like to know what ramifications does it have? Does nature possibly utilize the disorder? How can we interpret experiments? Because experiments were often interpreted as if you have a T equals zero situation, and now we understand a little bit how the disorder is, but of course it could be that we have, you know, not a continuous distribution, but rather more discrete kind of, of randomness. It can be either like this or like this or like that. And then, uh, you know, that we can refine these models. But I think we have shown here that you have to take a big step towards understanding random systems if you want to be serious about uh, um, uh, quantum biology. Quantum biology is quantum chemistry at physiological temperature. So you, you put them outside or? Just put the list. Yeah. Would you like 
button, yeah? Okay, this button, mm -hmm. on the table. Okay, so uh, two announcements. This gentleman who just spoke up, that's Meli Sena, who actually did a beautiful work on, on what you would call quench disorder. Second, I mentioned yesterday that we want to have a second uh, 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 feedback from you on the different subject that we, that we uh, include in the conference, like this awful lecture now. And so please uh, give us, uh, pick up these questionnaires uh, at the, on the table and fill them out and either give them as you leave today here or give them to us if you feel maybe you want to also include something on the tutorial this afternoon, then uh, leave them in the tutorial room with the person who is in charge there. Uh, these feedback forms are very important for us so that we next time might say, okay, maybe some subjects are of, of greater or lesser interest than others, and uh, that we would like to know from you. So uh, then uh, I drove you hard, but uh, maybe we still only give you 20 minutes, is that fine? So I, in 20 minutes, I will have Melich get you back. <laughs>